Good morning to you from Holy Trinity Gislam. Um, I was taken back to my school days and uh, I was thinking this morning about what it is to be punished when you're naughty. And uh, I can remember standing outside the headmistress's office and uh, in a bit of fear and trepidation as to what she was going to say to me concerning the deed that I've committed. And uh, it's quite a daunting prospect to be brought before the authorities. And uh, I want to read to you a chapter this morning. I just pray you'll bear with me. I'm going to read up to uh, chapter verse 26 in Joshua 24. And uh, I need to read the whole thing in order to give you the context. And uh, I thought about what this meant to be gathered before the greatest authority of all, the Lord God. And of course, the, uh, the doings of the children of Israel and what they got involved in. But, um, I'd like to share this piece with you and then just talk about some verses. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave Isaac unto Jacob and Esau. Sorry. And I gave unto Isaac, Jacob and Esau. And I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses and also an Aaron. And I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward I brought you out. And I brought out your fathers out of Egypt. And you came unto the sea, and the Egyptians pursued after, after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea upon them, and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And you dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you out into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand, that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Let's go on to verse 11. And when you went over Jordan and came under Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, and the Amorites and the Perizzites and all the other ites. Verse 12. And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you even two kings of the Amorites, but not with my sword, nor with my bow. And I have given unto you a land for which you did not labor, cities you didn't build, you dwell in them, from on the vineyards and olive yards which you planted, now do you eat. Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve you the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in which whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt. It's going on to verse 18. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, even the Amorites which dwelt in the land. Therefore, therefore, we will serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he has done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Your witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. 
Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God we will we serve, and his voice will we obey. And so Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. A daunting prospect, yes, to be summoned before God, and then to have to make such a, such a covenant before him, and then to have it set in stone. And um, this expression, the other side of the flood, really struck me because you won't find it anywhere else other than in the KJV. And uh, you can be forgiven for being misled into thinking that he's talking about Noah's flood. But actually he's not because they're two different Hebrew words. And um, the flood that it's talking about here is beyond the river. If you read other translations, it says beyond the river. And it's referring to the Euphrates. And it's referring to Abraham's journey. And that journey is interesting, actually, because uh, I actually noted it down here. And it goes like this. It says, from Ur, Abram traveled 700 miles to the borders of present-day Iraq, and 700 miles into Syria, and another 800 down to Egypt by the inland road, and then back to Canaan, what is now Israel. And it's interesting, isn't it? And... Uh, I note the spiritual parallel here, that they had to first go down into Egypt before they could come back to the Promised Land. It's a bit like when Jesus had to go down into Egypt to be protected so that he wouldn't be killed, and then to come back to, to um, the land of, of the Promise, where everything was to happen. Spiritually, it's interesting, and this is what I felt the Lord was saying to me, that spiritually we are on the other side of the flood the other side of Noah's flood. We've been saved, haven't we? We've been put into his ark, that spiritual ark of salvation. And of course we know in the days of the tribulation also we will be saved again by the rapture. And um, there's always that deliverance from God taking us to the right side of the flood. And I just want to emphasize that this morning. And um, although we've crossed the river, the Euphrates, physically and ended up um, where we are. So also we spiritually cross the river. Let's have a look at some verses here. Verse 7. And it says, And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. God put that darkness between the Egyptians and the Israelites. We've spoken about darkness before. That division from evil is the point that I wanted to make out of this verse. God divides us from evil. Think about Lazarus and the beggar. There's a great gulf between them. I mean, Lazarus and the rich man, sorry. There's a great gulf between them that couldn't be crossed. And God puts a gulf between us and evil. Although we experience evil, we're on the right side of the flood, remember. And God has given us his power and his strength to walk with him as we choose him daily. Verse 8. I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land. I wrote a note here. I wrote, we need courage to enter the land of evil and fight Satan, to possess the earth with Christ. Satan's kingdom will be wrested from him. Yes, he still has it now physically. He is still the God of this age. But it's been wrested from him in the spirit. We're already on the right side of the flood. The division has been put between us and evil. What's required of us is to say, yes, we will serve the Lord. And it's interesting here in verse 11. And you went over Jordan and came unto Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites and the Perizzites and all those other ites, as I said earlier. And God delivered them from all the ites, all the different tribes, the giants, and um, all the powers of evil. And it's interesting that after each victory, after each enemy was defeated, there was a deliverance. And it seems to go on, doesn't it? Even in our own lives, we, we go from one enemy to another. 
I have the enemy of arthritis now in my right ankle. And uh, it pains me in the morning when I get up and I start to walk on it. And uh, of course, I'm seeking God for, for deliverance, for healing. And it comes to my mind all the time, never lose that hope. You're going to get what you've asked for. And um, that's how it is. One victory after another. One enemy after another. But God gives victory. Each time there's a trouble in our lives, God delivers us from it. Everything becomes history in the end. Everything passes. Verse 13. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you built not. And you dwell in them of the vineyards and olive yards which he planted. Not do you eat. No work was done at all in order to give them that land. Reminds me of Adam and Eve. They were put in that garden, not to till it by the sweat of their brow, but they were to enjoy the fruits of it. And God gave them special power to look after it. And of course that power they lost when, when they fell. And this is what God wants to do in our lives. He wants to, to give us something that we didn't work for. It's the work that's already been done in our hearts by Jesus on the cross and by the shedding of his blood and by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. So in effect, this verse it symbolizes a return to Eden, doesn't it? Paradise lost, and we're coming back to Eden where we don't work for it anymore. God has given it to us by his grace. Verse 14 starts with an interesting word. He says, now, therefore. And this word, therefore, comes up an awful lot, especially as it's interpreted and translated in the KJV, therefore. Derek Prince, a great Bible teacher of his time, had the uh, fortune of uh, being at one of his meetings personally, and it was, it was quite an experience. He used to say, a therefore is there, and we've got to know what it's there for. Where you see a therefore, know what it's there for. And I think that, that is always so important. And of course, this one here says, fear the Lord. Serve him in, his, in, in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood before they crossed the Euphrates, before the ark door closed and we were saved. Remember, the two different floods. And... Um, we make the decision, don't we, to serve. And I wrote this in Block Capitals this morning. Serve we. We serve by decision, choosing every moment, living in the decision. And that's the important thing. And they chose the Lord. Verses 16 to 18. The people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up out of the land of Egypt. And he drove away all the enemies from before them, the Amorites and all the rest of it, as I've said before. And they made that choice to, choose, to serve the Lord. And that's what we do, don't we? We choose daily, hourly, momentarily to serve the Lord as he builds the fruits of the Spirit into our lives. But in 19 and 20, it's interesting. It says here, And Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He won't forgive your sins and your transgressions, nor your sins. If you stop there, it's like, well, God will never forgive. But then in verse 20, he says, if ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt. So he's saying here that he won't forgive you if you turn and forsake him. But he will forgive you if you turn and repent. And that's the important thing, is that when we fall away, when we drop our cross sometimes, we turn back and we realize that we are on the pathway upward to that prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. In verse 21, And the people said unto Joshua, Neighbor, we will serve the Lord. And it crossed my mind that we can easily say that, can't we? We will serve the Lord. Peter said, But Lord, I will never forsake you. Never shall it be that we shall turn from you. And of course we know what happened with Peter, don't we? And it's so easy to say things with our mouth. But it's what we do with our hearts. It's how we behave with our actions. It's easy to say we will serve. But God wants from us that sincerity of action. And that, that doing that he wants from us. 
And he takes our words seriously. And we witness against ourselves, verse 22, And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves, that you have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. You see, that, that contract was made. The seal was put on that contract. And God took their words seriously. And it's the same with us. When we make a, a declaration before God, it's a serious thing. And God sets his seal on that. That like signing a contract to buy something. and There's all that wording in the contract, all that small print that says, if you don't abide by these rules, we'll take the item back that you're paying for. We'll repossess it. Let not God repossess that which he's given to us. Let's walk on and let's take his word seriously. Finishing up here, it says in verse 26, And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. It's not a stone anymore that our covenant with God is written on. It's not written on tablets of stone. God said, I will write my law in your hearts. And it's the indwelling spirit, isn't it, that enables us to, to keep this contract. The spirit, the water, and the blood. As John said, these three agree. And it's the power of the spirit. It's the burial by baptism. And it's the shedding of the blood. And those are the things that witness to us in these days. In those days, they didn't have it. Today, we do. And... Um, Let's remember what we have passed over to. I just want to end with one verse here in John. And it's uh, chapter 5, verse 24. If I can just give me a moment to find it. Chapter 5, verse 24. And it says, Verily, verily, Jesus said, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And there's the spiritual parable, parallel, sorry. We've passed from death to life. We've crossed over the Euphrates on our way to the promised land. We've crossed the river. And we're on the other side of the flood. We're on the right side of the flood, the correct side of the flood. And we've passed from death. And um, it's interesting that it's only the NIV and the complete Jewish Bible that... Um, talk about crossing over from death to life and it's that river crossing that we've made and so I commit that word to you today and um, let's remember in our hearts that we've crossed the river we've crossed from death to life and um, it's written in our hearts and we need to go on knowing that we've made that that we're walking in that covenant with God and in that strength of his power have a blessed day